Thank you for checking out Museum Ship Mafia, where we take you behind the scenes of the museum ships across the country and around the world. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X, and tonight, another live crossover broadcast with USS Slater and the guys from the Buffalo Naval Park. On tonight's live episode, we're going to be talking about the SS Red Oak Victory, which is a commissioned Boulder Victory class cargo ship that uh, saw action in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. We're going to have uh, Fred Klink, who is, um, I know he's director of marketing. I think he's also chairman of the Red Oak Victory. So he's going to tell us all about it. Uh, let's see. And tonight, actually, all right. So there's a picture of the Red Oak Victory. One of the questions we're going to answer is uh, one thing I've always wanted to wonder or always wanted to know, is the, a ship like the Red Oak Victory considered a warship? So Fred's going to help us answer that question. Um, so yeah, this will be uh, pretty interesting, I think, for everybody. And the other thing I want to say is this episode tonight is made possible by Audible Audiobooks. Make sure you listen to the good stuff. Check out the link to Audible below in the description of this broadcast. Uh, broadcast. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, let's see. So tonight, we're going to start with John Epp. Add him to the stream. There we go, John. How are you doing this evening? Hey, Ken. Good. How are you? Doing all right. Uh, let's see. John Epp, curator at the USS Slater in Albany, New York. You can check out their YouTube channel. Simply search for the USS Slater. Uh, recently, they've exceeded 2,100 subscribers. They've got great content on their YouTube channel. You can also visit their website ussslater.org. And let's see, we've also got the guys from the Buffalo Naval Park, Shane Stevenson, curator, Stephen Tedesco, educational director, Buffalo and Erie County Naval Military Park. Check out their YouTube channel uh, simply by searching for the Buffalo Naval Park. You can also check out the website, buffalonavalpark.org. Like I always say, one of the simplest yet most effective ways to support John, Shane, Stephen, and their work at the Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park is to not only subscribe to their YouTube channels, uh, but check out their content. It's fascinating stuff, and it's one of the simplest yet mo most effective ways to throw support behind their efforts. Um, also want to mention, can't do this without subscribers and viewers. So please, tonight, if you have any questions about the Red Oak Victory, submit your comments, submit your questions. And we'll try and get them answered for you. In the meantime, let us know where you're from. Where are you watching us? Are you watching us on the Slater's YouTube channel, the Buffalo Naval Park, or maybe on my channel, History X? Throw that in the comments. We've already got a ton of people that have already logged on. So great to have you with us. Uh, John, at the Slater, what's uh, what's the latest with you guys uh, post-holidays? Uh, let's see. We are continuing our winter maintenance and restoration. We're working on renewing some wasted steel in the officer's ward room. And we're also restoring the storeroom directly below aft cruise berthing uh, to create more storage for our collections. So when you say wasted steel, and I saw that you had this in a posting the other day, it might've been on your Facebook, uh, Facebook page. What exactly is wasted steel? It's just the rusted out steel. Um, it's 78 years old. Uh, we've discovered some leaks into the officer's wardroom. We can't do the work during the season because it just becomes a mess and uh, the tour route would be affected. So we wait until the winter when everybody is off. And is that a lot of work with a needle gun just <clears throat> pounding away the rust? Uh, it's more just cutting it away and installing and welding new bulkhead, new pieces of uh, oh, new piece of steel. Yeah. It's over okay. my head. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a very maintenancey guy. So, gotcha. Uh, all right, moving on to. Whoops, bear with me a moment. Sorry about that. Uh, all right, and going to the Buffalo Naval Park. My apologies. I had a screen go blank. Uh, Shane, Stephen, what's the latest from the Buffalo Naval Park? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. Welcome. We survived this, uh, cyclone thing that we had a few weeks ago during uh, the Christmas weekend. 
And uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of driving bans. So the ships were alone for about four days, five, four and a half days or so. Uh, I came down just to walk around to see. I didn't go on board. Uh, but when we did have staff on board, we found that there is water intrusion in uh, the forward engine room and through the transverse bulkhead that leads to the aft fire room. Uh, it was about 30 inches in both spaces. Uh, so we're pumping that out uh, and we're testing it. Uh, we do have Joe Lombardi and Ocean Technical Services here. And uh, we also have Bidco here. So we have about nine pairs of eyes that are walking around the Sullivans daily, taking measurements, uh, checking the clinometer, and checking other spaces. You know, certainly the freshwater tanks, uh, the feeding tanks, uh, to see if there's been any other intrusion. But uh, so there has been about uh, 30 inches in those two spaces, and uh, but they are pumping and monitoring. Uh, turning the pumps on and off and seeing if it fills back up and because uh, there's been some discrepancies with the uh, things. So uh, that's what's going on with the ships. Again, on YouTube, we've been doing those updates. Um, Stephen? Stephen? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, wait a second. Let me let me let me interrupt real quick. Just just so everyone's aware, this is not water that's coming through the hull. This is from runoff of all the snow that's landed on the decks. Uh, no, I do. I would not agree with that. That oh, so it is coming in through the hull. We are thinking uh, there might be because what happened was. The ships during our, during that blizzard, the ships raised about eight or nine feet, uh, and so again, just like the capsizing in April, we think that uh, she may have again hit the bottom of the river when the sage uh, washed out, uh, and there may have been some degradation. I mean, it was unbelievable here. I, I mean, I know we have a time lapse video and stuff that we've put on uh, our YouTube channel, but. I mean, when you have 75 mile an hour winds with the snow, uh, there could have been anything. There's There were huge logs, uh, full trees. It, it was just an unbelievable experience. So uh, once the water gets pumped out, we will then be able to tell. Uh, certainly, it would not have been runoff. Usually, uh, you know, from the upper decks, it's usually the uh, little rock that that suffers from where there's snow and then it comes through uh, those bimetallic welds, uh, or if there's some degradation on a deck on the O3 level, runs the O2 uh, and then to Maine. Uh, but for the Sullivans, that's not really that much of an issue. Um, so yeah, we do think, I mean, to go from nine feet to go, yeah, where you raise for nine feet for two days and then you come back down, uh, you know, there's no doubt that they hit the bottom, at, she hit the bottom at some point. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. It's just something that we're going to have to deal with. We've certainly, you know, talked about excavating the river more. Uh, but again, now that runs into the millions of dollars. So uh, that's the sort of thing that we are working on. But again, we have nine or 10 pairs of eyes on it that are there every day um, measuring, pumping, analyzing, data analysis, things like that. So we've had. Okay. We've, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was reading your um, your your newsletter, and it yes. mentioned uh, probably probably because of the storm, the Sullivan's is rise a little bit in the in the bow. You're thinking maybe some silt had gotten under there, and create a pile. That is one of the theories. That's a, that's a good question. That is one of the theories. Uh, they're still looking now. The completely the whole front of the USS the Sullivan's is dry. Uh, right to the first machinery space, the forward uh, fire room. So again, the mess decks, we've gone through there, we've gone through the reefers, we've gone through the peak, uh, the bosun stores, the medical stores, uh, all of the birthing there. We've gone down to the sonar compartments. Uh, everything's totally dry. So uh, that is, um, that is a, a question that we think. I mean, of course, yeah, you get, when you have that much water and that much force, it certainly can build up silt. And now the river, the space between the Sullivans and the river 
is less than it was on December 23rd. Was this the largest storm since you've started there that you've experienced? Absolutely. Hmm. We've had wind storms. And again, we go to that video, high winds and Navy ships. Um, but that was just wind. And that was about 75 miles an hour. So they equated this to a uh, category three hurricane is what they wow. were equating the winds to. So really unlike wow. a hurricane, uh, you know, when you have a blizzard and a hurricane mixed together, the snow doesn't just go away. So the snow, I mean, I had four feet in my house. You, yeah, I think about you said four about four feet. feet. Yeah. And then with the wind and the drifts and everything, I mean, there were areas that were six feet, um, which is not necessarily uncommon, like in southern on, in the southern tier, um, but not in the city of Buffalo. And it was just kind of a disaster. Um, like Shane said, the driving ban was lifted started on friday and i think it was lifted on tuesday afternoon or when, wednesday thursday so, so it was almost a full week that we had a driving ban in the city um I'm, i mean you you would like to think a city like buffalo is prepared for that but we were just caught off guard i mean there's i think it's like 42 deaths related to the blizzard um it, it, so where i grew up we had hurricanes and this is, I mean, I've never seen a storm like this. I can honestly say that this is probably the worst storm I've ever lived through. No kidding. I, I mean, I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't need to go off into the vernacular, but I mean, I took a walk to a store and I was nervous walking. <laughs> you know, a lot of the deaths that Stephen had mentioned were people that just collapsed or they got lost because the, uh, the whiteout was so great, you didn't know where you were. And uh -huh. you just get confused and stressed out. And then all of a sudden, you know, and it's not mm -hmm. a good situation. So I was nervous taking a 0.4 mile walk uh, to go to the store to get something. So um, uh, thankfully, they were open and, and I made it home. But yeah, I mean, at one point, there was um, not a single fire truck for Buffalo Fire Department was accessible. Um, I mean, you had pictures of plows, snow plows, like, you know, government snow plows in ditches. Like, it was just, I've never yeah. seen anything like it. It's, yeah. it's kind of insane. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. getting back. And this, was, and this was the second, this was the second major storm that you guys had. Yeah, we had that seven footer, uh, that seven feet in uh, November, right? Around and then we had one probably a week before that. So we've had three pretty bad storms this year. And it's, it's only, as we know, it's only January. So we have about yeah. another two and a half months to go. Uh, the croaker weathered fair, fairly well. Uh, we had some leaking uh, through a valve, but very minimal, just a drip drip, uh, because that was packed this summer. And the Little Rock had some water incursion, as I'd said, from the upper decks uh, into our 12-man uh, birthing space. Uh, but uh, we, you know, we're sealing it up and uh, we're going to locate it up top. But at least that overhead has been sealed. So we have a lot some of the footage posted on our Instagram page. And I mean, if you saw the croaker, I mean, the bottom of the croaker was even with the sidewalk. It was like, I mean, it was absolutely insane. Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, I mean, we really wanted to get down here and to be with the ships. And uh, we just we just couldn't. You know, it just was not, not, not a good thing. So that's ultimately what's going on with us. Um, you know, well, how about some good news about the Sullivans? Um, She's not, you know, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, this, I'm talking about this. So the uh, guided missile cruiser, or the uh, USS, the Sullivans, are you guys aware of this? I sent Shane a text about it this morning. Yeah, you did. I, yeah, I saw that. Fabulous. Uh, yeah, so the USS The Sullivans captured a huge uh, amount of guns that I think were coming. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting these details right. Coming from Iran and I think going to Yemen. Yeah. And it was the USS The Sullivans that that captured all of these weapons. So that was in the news that I caught this morning. It may have been out uh, a while ago, but I just uh, came across it today and wanted to make everyone aware of it. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, it work. We always um, try to we always try to say that you know there's a uh, Sullivans out there right now carrying on the tradition, and uh, you know we we have to do a better job here of connecting with the DDG sixty eight crew. It's a way of keeping fresh blood here at the Naval Park, 
getting those, uh, the old uh, sailors, they're not old, uh, but the sailors who had served aboard at some time in their career to come on down and to uh, give help to 537. So we have to do a better job of trying to connect with those, uh, the men and women from 68. So, uh, uh, John, uh, what's the Slater doing to fight terrorism? <laughs> oh. um, not a whole lot. You know, there was only, there's only been one USS Slater in the Navy, and that was, that was us in World War II, so... Yeah. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Sure, I love that. Um, you know, we do have one we have a piece of good news, uh, kind of good news, right? What's that? Yeah. yeah. Look on the sheet. There you go. Oh, yeah. So, we're, hold on. We just got to um, talk go about on. the uh, Naval Park yeah, go ahead. You do YouTube it. page real quick. Um, we yeah, are go ahead. officially starting our memberships tonight. Um, so, once... Really? Tonight? Tonight, tomorrow. 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 Or, or whatever. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we will have um, all the details on our YouTube page, but... We're going to do a video. You'll get, um, you know, just... It's four ninety nine a month, and you can subscribe to our YouTube page. You would get, um, you know, a uh, specific... It's all written right there. Specific. Um, that's not the word. I'm, an exclusive. 20, exclusive, yeah. Exclusive 20 hundred watch each month, and exclusive member videos each month. Um, just another way we're trying to pull in some revenue here and hopefully you all sign up. Yeah. So for our membership program, a lot of places do it. There's uh, Patreon. I don't even know if I want to say the names or even if I'm getting it right. Uh, but we're going to go right through the YouTube uh, for members. It is, as uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, $4.99 a month. And you, again, you'll get one extra uh, exclusive live 2000 watch and uh, two member exclusive videos a month. So we're probably going to film. I'm a, I think this is a fantastic idea. I'm a huge fan of museum ships, uh, you know, uh, museums, preservation societies, try and expand their footprint, generate additional revenue through social media. And I'm glad to see you guys do this. I think, I think more museum ships should be doing exactly what you guys are taking on. So uh, when, when, when does this go live again? So we got approved yesterday, and um, okay. so it's technically ready to go. We just haven't, you know, hit the enter button yet. Yeah. But uh, I mm -hmm. would say tomorrow. Um, yeah, we're going to try and film a video tomorrow, if that is good with you. Uh, kind of giving the introduction. We'll upload it, and then we'll make that member page available for people. Um, I don't remember offhand, but I think there are – goals that you might have to reach before you can do a membership? I don't know. Do, uh, Ken, do you know anything about it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In order to actually start doing members, and I actually experimented with this a little bit. I I, I felt it was too soon for History X to do it, but I, I want to say that you had to reach like, it might have been 500 subscribers. I don't think it was a lot. Oh, okay. All um, right. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's a thousand. But, you know... And, and a lot of people have heard me say it before. Uh, I really do think museums, museum ships have to change their game plan. In, in my opinion, and we're going to have Fred uh, Clink coming on um, from the Red Oak Victory. He might have an opinion about this as well. But in my opinion, it, it, it can't only be about feet through the door. You know, it's got to be about eyes on whatever the museum is about and those eyes through social media that generates revenue. It generates advertising dollars. So why not have a member section where people can get additional access for what you guys have going on, you know, whether it's behind the scenes, additional information, whatever, and use it to generate additional revenue. I, I, uh, I say way to go. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have going on. Thanks. And uh, yeah, we're excited. We're excited to connect. Uh, we've got those little uh, things all ready to go, the little things that would go next badges. to someone's ne badges. <laughs> Thanks, no Kevin. I knew what he was talking about. <laughs> we don't need you no know, badges. Yeah. Shane, we'll just, we'll just, uh, we'll just leave it to you. you guys. Got some good videos coming up, and uh, we'll look forward to checking them out. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but yeah. that's it for, for Are us. you going to be doing uh, 28 and 28 again? Oh, boy. You know that's what? That's coming up. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it I, is. I don't. That's there's it. so much work to do in the collections, everybody. Uh, there's so much work going on already. We're doing the ad. Like the shorts. 
do I've 28 heard. shorts in 28 days. Yeah, I don't know about we shorts. We can talk we'll about it to... because I wanted to start making some like educational videos yeah. like, on stuff like that. So if we tag team it, I mean, it's something we might be able to stay tuned, John. <laughs> yeah, the British Bulldogs will tag team it. Well, before before we get uh, Fred uh, Clink on here from the Red Oak uh, Victory, anything else that either uh, John you wanted to add from the Slater or you guys from the Buffalo Naval Park? Nope. No, I think that's okay. that's that's kind of the update. Then the one thing I want to say, and I kind of touched on this in the beginning, is that we actually have a sponsor for Museum Ship Mafia Audible audiobooks and. You know, check out the link below. You know, like we talked about a little bit ago, it's all about experimenting. It's all about finding new ways of revenue to support these museum ships. And having Audible as a sponsor, I think, is pretty valuable. So check out the link to Audible below in the description of this bo uh, broadcast. Have you have you guys ever downloaded an Audible I audio, audio I book? I do it. I do. Um, you do? Yeah, I don't know how to read, so I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Uh, I, I do have a, a subscription audible and you know, it takes me 40 minutes to get to work. Um, so it's a nice to, you know, not listen to the same seven songs over and over again. So the, I, um, the one, the one book we talk about a lot on museum ship mafia, last stand of the tin can sailors. Uh, I know a lot of viewers out there have talked about reading this book, but if you have not read the book, and you've been thinking about doing it for quite a long time, uh, check out Audible. They've got Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors by James Horn Fisher on there. Uh, get a subscription. My The audio, the first audio book I ever listened to on Audible was actually Black Sheep, uh, Baba Black Sheep by uh, Pappy Boyington. Uh, and it's a book I'd wanted to read for a long time. It's a long book, but on Audible, it's a fantastic... Uh, I was going to say read, but I guess actually listen is the right way to put it. Um, Anyway, check out Audible. Like I said, there's a link in the description below. You don't even have to sign up. If you just check out the link, even that even helps what we're doing here tonight. So um, ch thanks to Audible for sponsoring Museum Ship Mafia. Now, I am going to get... Yeah, I think uh, AMN UCC. I'm going to get the Rogue Victory going here and we're going to add Fred Klink to the mix. So like I said, tonight we're going to be talking about the Red Oak Victory. It's a, uh, bear with me a second. I just lost my notes. So the Red Oak Victory is a victory class cargo ship that first uh, saw uh, action during World War II and is on display in California. Uh, it's a commissioned Boulder Victory Class cargo ship on display at the Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historic Park in Richmond, California. To check out the Red Oak Victory's website, go to www.redoakvictory.us. Or you can check out their YouTube channel. Simply search for Red Oak Victory. Uh, channel has over 2,600 subscribers. Some pretty interesting videos. So tonight we've got Fred Klink with us. And Fred uh, is the... Bear with me a second. There's Fred. Fred's the chairman and director of marketing for the Red Oak Victory. Um, as I said, the Red Oak's on display in Richmond, California. Fred's, uh, Fred, thanks for joining us tonight. How are you? Thank you, Ken. I appreciate being uh, being invited to the to the podcast, and especially getting yeah. to talk about cargo ships instead of warships. So I guess that's uh, <laughs> that's one of the the issues that we were going to address. <laughs> Isn't the Red Oak Victory, or can't the Red Oak Victory be considered a warship? You know, since you asked that, I I gave that some thought, and the first thing that came to mind was. General Bradley's comment that the, uh, the professionals think about logistics and amateurs think about tactics. And if you think about logistics, then clearly you're talking about cargo ships, you know, getting the, the bullets, beans and, and bandages where they need to be. Um, so in that sense, a, a cargo ship is certainly an integral part of the whole warfighting machine. 
Um, without them, there there wouldn't be a war. Um, there certainly wouldn't be any supplies to, to prosecute that war. Um, one thing I found interesting, because I, I, we also talked, we wanted to bring in some a little bit of a discussion about liberty ships. And I didn't know this until I started looking for a little bit of background on, on liberty ships. But the liberty ship SS Stephen Hopkins was the first ship to sink a German surface vessel in World War II. Hmm. And she engaged the German commerce raider Stier and, and sunk her. <laughs> and so I guess that, that certainly makes the SS Stephen Hopkins a warship. Um, hey, Fred. Hey, Fred. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, was the, did they have the same armament, the Liberty ships as Victory ships, the three inch, five inch, and 20s? Yeah, the uh, Liberty ships had a more primitive five inch gun. They had a First World War version of a, uh, I can't remember what the caliber was. The, on the Victories, it's a five inch 38. On the Liberty ships, it was a longer barreled gun, and I don't, I don't remember the exact number. Um, but essentially, yeah, they had a, there was a three inch on the bow, a, uh, which you can see in the picture there, yeah. um, a five inch on the stern, and then eight 20 millimeter, uh, essentially anti-aircraft guns. Uh, some of the victory ships, like the attack transports, were a little bit more heavily armed. There were, among the victory ships that were built, there were 117 Haskell-class attack transports, and they carried a, a bit heavier armament, especially the addition of uh, twin 40-millimeter mounts. Well, let's get into the history about how the Victory ships and the Liberty ships came about. You gave, sure. or I should say you sent along uh, a whole bunch of photos <laughs> and and they, you know, they were pretty fascinating. But I think a lot of people out there watching may not know the history. So I wanted you to get into it a little bit. Sure. Um, so the picture there is Henry J. Kaiser. And as we were talking about earlier, he was a... He was a remarkable fellow. Um, I think his, the most remarkable thing about him is he just never took no for an answer. Uh, he, his first big project was, he was the cement contractor for Hoover Dam. And then he applied to the people building the Shasta Dam and said, I want the cement contract. And they didn't give it to him. They, they gave it to somebody else. So he said, well, you know what? I can deliver cement cheaper than those other guys and the way he did it was by building a bunch of cargo ships and shipping it up the california coast uh up to shasta's up in in northern california um so that was sort of his entree into into shipbuilding and then in 1940 he took a contract with the british government to build what were called ocean class transport vessels very very similar to what ultimately became the Liberty ships. And they chose to build, these ocean class uh, ships were essentially a design from 1890 and they were coal fired. Uh, but all of this was done because they could be built quickly. They, like the Liberty ships were triple expansion steam engines, which were easy to build. I think 18 different manufacturers built triple expansion steam engines at the time. Um, Turbine steam turbines were the state of the art, but they were reserved for uh, the the warships that were being built. So uh, the ocean class ships, and then ultimately the Liberty ships, which overlapped a little bit uh, in terms of the the the, uh, the years that they were being built, uh, were were the this more primitive, um, older technology, but reliable, easy to maintain. Um, you know all of the all the reasons that that you'd want in a in a cargo ship just to keep them going. Um, ultimately, there were I think I made some notes for myself because I wasn't really familiar with the ocean class vessels. I think there were 60, 60 or ninety ocean class ships eventually built, uh, but then they started building the Liberty ships in nineteen forty one, even before the United States entered the war, and ultimately there were two thousand. 710 Liberty ships built. 
uh, and, and were the Liberty ships and the Victory ships were they all built in? Well, I guess I already know the answer. They were not all built at the same shipyard, but oh no, the Kaiser. <laughs> Yeah, the Kaiser shipyard, which I think is this uh, picture that you sent. Correct. They, they yeah. you know, a lot of them came from this location. They did. Um, the Richmond Kaiser shipyard is the one that we're looking at here. And if you look at the, uh, this is a picture, this overview of yard number three, and there are five dry docks where uh, ships are being constructed. The the fifth one, the one furthest to the right, is where we are presently located so this uh there's still a, a lot of this shipyard is is still there uh, all five dry docks are still there they're not dry docks any longer they took the doors off the end and their piers uh but they're part of the active uh port of richmond at this point um yeah ultimately they were they, there were uh victory ships didn't begin construction until 1944 so most of the the effort uh in cargo ships was the liberty class ships and the liberty ships were built in 18 different shipyards around the united states the victory ships were built in a half a dozen different shipyards and only one of those is on the east coast so the other five were west coast shipyards and again the reason was the war by now uh was the the war for the north atlantic was won the real issue was the pacific war and supporting the uh, the end of the war in the Pacific. Um, this is another terrific painting. The painting is actually bigger than what's shown right here, uh, but it's an extremely detailed view of um, the uh, uh, shipyard number three, and it just shows the the efficiency of building ships. Went from building a cargo ship the size of a victory ship and. 1940 took about a year and Red Oak Victory was not atypical. She was built in 88 days uh, because of prefabrication, uh, pre-staging of, of parts, uh, a huge labor force. There were 93,000 people employed in the Richmond uh, Kaiser shipyards. And you compare that to the city of Richmond, which before the war was 40,000 people, uh, so we more than doubled the population of the city just by bringing the uh, the shipyards there. This is another one of the pictures of one of the prefab, uh, and the you can see two prefabricated deck houses. There was kind of an interesting story about the deck houses for the victory ships. They were too heavy to be carried by the cranes, even double, even using two cranes, which they did a lot. Um, they were too heavy to be carried by the cranes, so they prefabricated them, they built them in these facilities and then cut them into four pieces and brought each individual piece out to the ship and welded them back together again. And it sounds crazy, but it turned out that that was the quickest and most efficient way to do it. Uh, and, and that's what they were all about in these shipyards during the war was how can we do this quickly and efficiently and and get the ship launched and start building the next one. There's a joke. Well, and that's about... one of the things that uh, Kaiser actually brought to the mix. I mean, he adopted yes. these sub assemblies that allowed these ships to really get assembled uh, quickly. As I understand it, one of his employees actually visited uh, Ford Manufacturing in Michigan. And is it correct that's kind of where they got the idea? Yeah. Um, well, in fact, there's a Ford plant within a stone's throw of, of shipyard number three. Um, it's part of the Rosie the Riveter National Park that you mentioned. Uh, it was a Ford assembly plant that had started an operation, I think in the 1920s. And then by World War II was building Jeeps and uh, armored cars. Uh, and that's uh, very close, essentially within the boundaries of, of, the, uh, of the Kaiser shipyards. But yeah, the, and, the whole idea of building these as sub-assemblies. The other thing that saved a lot of time is these were all welded ships. The the Liberties and the Victory class ships were all completely welded construction, uh, not riveted. And that that had some interesting, uh, there's some interesting elements of that. Some of the old sailors didn't want to sail on a welded ship <laughs> because they felt that it was too inflexible and was, they were going to 
fall apart at sea. And we always laugh about that, but it turns out a couple of the Liberty ships did experience hull cracks and at least one of them split in half while at sea. Um, and when the Victory ships, they began building Victory ships, they changed the frame spacing from 30 inches for the Liberties to 36 inches for the, um, the Victory ships. And that uh, gave the ships more flexibility. And of course, Victory ships continued to serve all the way up to 1970 um, and without mishap. So maybe that was the solution. They still don't really know what caused the, the hull cracks. Hey, well, they, uh, I mean, the term you're talking about is called brittle fracture, right? Right. And and wasn't that, didn't they figure out that that was due to the fact that, you know, these ships are actually getting really cold in the North Atlantic. And before they made the changes you were talking about, they were really susceptible to these cracks. Yeah, that was one of the, that was one of the, probably the, the, the most viable engineering theory is they went from steel will go from ductile to brittle at certain temperatures and, and they were um, the belief was that the hulls were getting cold enough on the North Atlantic passage that that it was embrittling the uh, the steel plate so yeah it's certainly possible um, uh, but Shane you, know, Shane, you had a question I didn't mean to cut you off go ahead Shane what, uh, what was the question sorry about that uh, the, the question Sam yeah uh, so it's there's a question that says how many <clears throat> oh, how many? Oh, okay, big question. Liberty ships still how many around. Oh. Liter Liberty ships, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There are three. I, I, no, I don't know. I'll let you if you. There, uh, there's two. I think the John W. Brown and the Jeremiah O'Brien. Okay, two. And um, and then there are three Victory ships. There's us. Oh, there's the Lane Victory in Los Angeles and the American Victory in Florida. Excellent. Yeah, kind of the way I think about it is, uh, and you can confirm if you can, Fred, that mm -hmm. uh, like Liberty ships, I always think of were constructed on the East Coast for the Atlantic. And then, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, Victory ships were on the Pacific for, uh, were on the West Coast for the Pacific. Is that kind of just a very broad think, stroke of? Yeah, I think that's, that's an accurate statement. Certainly by 44, the focus was on uh, getting cargo ships for the Pacific theater. Yeah. Um, the uh, interesting too, that you mentioned that because of the 2,700 Liberty ships, 200 were lost during the war. Most of those to enemy action, couple to accidents and storms victory ships. There were only three lost to enemy action wow. and all three of those were kamikaze attacks. Um, the, the big advantage the victories had, there, there were several, but the big advantage they had was speed. Uh, a, a Liberty ship at best could do 11 knots. Hmm. And I always tell our visitors, I say, leave the, when you leave the parking lot, drive <laughs> about 12 or 13 miles per hour and imagine going across the North Atlantic in the winter, going that speed uh, at, at best. I mean, the, they had to, they had to be because they were slow. They had to be convoyed, so convoy went at the speed of the slowest ship. Um, victory ships were 17 knots. I have some indication from a document on board the Red Oak from her sea trials that she was able to make 20 knots unloaded, of course. But um, so these ships were fast. They were faster than the Japanese I boats and the German U boats. Um, now both. Both Germany and Japan had high-speed submarines by the end of the war, but there weren't enough of them deployed to, to make a difference. Um, so the the victory ships, none of the victory ships were lost to submarines. Uh, all three were kamikaze attacks. And remarkable that only three you know, compared to 200 liberty ships that were lost. Um, uh, what are you talking uh, about? Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Shane. I'm sorry. Uh, do you, when you say kamikaze attacks, was it, you know, they the plane plowed through the main deck into the cargo holds and, you know, like on a carrier and it just exploded uh, different compartments uh, due to ammunition or? Yeah, I don't know the 
details of those of those three attacks. Um, but 20 of the victory ships that were used in the Pacific were ammunition carriers, including the Red Oak. Um, and so it's, it's certainly possible. And we know from the Port Chicago disaster that a ship full of ordnance goes up like a small nuclear weapon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, bef before we got, before we get into the history of the Red Oak victory specifically, mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch on that I thought were pretty interesting in the reading that I've been doing. So the Kaiser shipyard modular assembly method actually allowed, allowed Kaiser to set a world record when it came to assembling a ship. And this is a picture <laughs> of the Robert E. Peary, which was assembled in and, and launched in other in under five days. Um, yeah. So, so from, from the point where the keel was laid until being launched, it was uh, like four and a half days. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. It was, I think four days, 15 and a half hours is the number that they, they always cite. Um, it's an, it's interesting to see that they could build the ship that quickly, but it was really a publicity stunt and oh, it, really, okay. um, it, it wasn't a typical, yeah, they, they did a lot of things to, to more, uh, pre-staging of the, of the assembly components and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the typical Liberty ship was built in. Um, I, I had written that down here. Let me see if I could find it. I think it was about 30 days, which is still remarkably fast. Um, yeah, but when you look at that, yeah, 40 days, feed, sorry. When you look at launching that ship in four or five days, I would have to assume, <laughs> okay, like you said, publicity stunt. Yeah. You know, it could also be, you know, part part of an effort to demoralize the enemy. I mean, if they look at the U yep. the US or the Allies being able to crank out a cargo ship in under a week, yeah. you, you know, the enemy had to wonder, it's like how are we going to be able to compete against this? Right. Right. Yeah, and and that's really the point of I think the key point of the history of World War II is this this incredible industrial capacity that the United States had and the incredible innovativeness of people like Kaiser that could just crank these ships out in, in no time. I mean, even even cranking one out every 40 days, and it wasn't one every 40 days because they're building in parallel. Um, I think the first liberties that were launched, they launched 14 ships in one day. Um, the victory ships took a little longer to build. They were about 90 days average, um, but still... You know, it, it's um, it's not something the the enemy could compete with yeah. in any way. Um, so yeah, that was a that was definitely a uh, uh, a key a key part of the story. Well, I think I think Henry Kaiser is uh, definitely a pretty amazing guy. You know, like like you mentioned before, he was one of the uh, the lead contractors on the Hoover Dam. But there's a couple yep. of other details about this guy that I think people watching tonight need to know and one of which is and shane john stephen tell me if you're aware of this uh kaiser also came up with the idea for the h4 hercules do you guys know what the h4 hercules is i didn't know he did that no i didn't know so that. john knows what it is sounds like a helicopter to me but i don't know it's the <laughs> flying boat yeah yep. it's the spruce goose oh yeah so everyone thinks of the Spruce Goose as Howard Hughes, but Kaiser's actually the one that came up with the idea. I thought Leonardo DiCaprio did. <laughs> <laughs> he, came, he came along later. And, oh, okay. and another interesting thing about Kaiser that I think, you know, you could say, okay, he was a fantastic industrialist, um, you know, came up with great ideas to mass produce ships. But even before the U.S. got into the war, uh, Kaiser also... Um, he got involved with war relief for refugees. And I'm talking about refugees that resulted from Hitler's conquest in Europe before the U.S. even got in, into World War II. And he was involved in, in gathering clothing 
for the refugees. So he wasn't just into, you know, making a buck. He wasn't just into, you know, doing incredible projects like the Hoover Dam and the Kaiser Shipyard. He also, he was a pretty serious humanitarian too. Yeah. Two things I'd like to mention about Kaiser that, that I find interesting. One is in terms of industrial relations, he essentially invented employer provided health care. And today oh, I've actually been a, a, a member of Kaiser Permanente Health Group for about 30 years. <laughs> and that was created at the Richmond Kaiser shipyards. He hired a uh, army doctor who had been uh, who'd served in the First World War. And he said, I want you to set up a health care emergency health care system for the shipyard workers. And this army doctor came in and said, well, basically you need you need medics with the frontline combat troops. You need an evacuation system and you need you need field hospitals. And and that's the system that he put in place. Essentially, um, we have a lot of visitors who work for the current Kaiser Healthcare who come and visit the ship. And from our bridge, you can see the little clinic building. It's still there. It's used for something else now, but the little clinic building that was the beginning of the Kaiser Permanente Healthcare. Um, but he, he did other things. He had daycare, dollar a day <laughs> um, for any worker at the, at the shipyard. He had, um, uh, he had also uh, come up with a housing office because, as you can imagine, 93,000 people flooding into a city that had capacity for 40,000. Housing was a big problem. And they had housing assistance for employees. And they built their own transit system. So there was a shipyard railway that went to all parts of the Bay Area. And they built, they, they actually bought a bunch of outdated 1890s uh, uh, elevated cars from New York City, and created a railway just for the uh, just for the workers at at uh, the shipyard. Uh, all of that in the name of efficiency, you know, getting making sure people can get to work, making sure they're not worried about housing, kids, healthcare, um, and um, you know, it was pretty remarkable. Uh, the other thing about him, you, you guys may be aware, certainly from a historic ship standpoint, this is important. He invented the concept of the escort carrier. And he went to DC, he went to the, the Department of the Navy and said, hey, I've got this great idea for the small, uh, lightweight, not very fast escort carrier that could be used to transport vehicles, could also be used uh, as, a, as a combat ship and the navy basically threw him out and said well we're not interested you know that sounds like a stupid idea <laughs> i don't know if they said that but they they essentially told him to get lost and the reason it's uh, people cite for that is the navy said well he's he's not one of us yeah. um, and so you know we're not gonna we, we didn't see no reason to follow his ideas well they didn't know henry too well so henry troops over to the white house visits President Roosevelt and says, hey, I've got this great idea for an escort carrier. And Roosevelt, of course, is a former uh, Secretary of the Navy. And he said, I think it's a terrific idea. He calls the Navy up and he says, hey, this guy Henry Kaiser's here in the Oval Office and he has an idea for an escort carrier and you're going to build them, right? And they said, yes, sir. <laughs> it turned out to be one of the most successful combat uh, ship types in World War II. <laughs> Yeah, other oh, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Ken. Yeah, well, that's all right. John, how many uh how many uh escort um uh, uh destroyers were actually built? I mean, it's almost like uh almost like a 10 to 1 ratio between Fletcher's and the uh sorry, DEs, you, right? How many DEs were built? 563 yeah. in the one. 563? Yep. Thought it was Fred might be talk Fred might be talking about Jeep carriers yeah. for the escort. Yeah, carriers. he's talking about Jeep yeah, carriers. I'm talking about uh oh okay. Carriers. Yeah. Destroyer escort too, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, I 
I heard that. It's like, okay, all right. So that's my mistake. My apologies. Okay. Yeah, so the, he the came DEs up with the idea for escort carriers. Like the escort carriers as hunter killer groups. Um, yeah. Very effective. Well, well, and the Navy thought so highly of Kaiser. Eventually, they they named a class of ship after this guy uh <laughs> at sea replenishment oilers the henry j kaiser class so i don't know i'm just really impressed with this guy it's, he's got a fan he's got a fantastic story you know to even have a, a class of ship you know named after you it, it's kind of a big deal so <laughs> if anyone yeah. has the opportunity to read up on henry j kaiser uh i strongly recommend it the guy's the guy's really impressive um so all right. So with that with that in mind, tell us about the Red Oak Victory. How long have you been with the Red Oak Victory? Sure. Um, I first came to the ship in 2016, and I was invited by the then director. So we had a little World War II Navy reenactment group, and he said, hey, we're doing something for Veterans Day or for um, uh yeah, blanking on which holiday it was. Maybe it was July 4th. But um, in any case, we said, sure, we'd be glad to come. We we went on the ship and and uh, said, what do you want us to do? He goes, I don't care. Whatever, you know, you got the run of the ship. So um, we we took over one of the guns and we took over the bridge. And, uh, and we had a great time, met some fantastic people. And then I decided to volunteer um, as a as a, a deckhand essentially <laughs> um the uh, my first day it was hammering down rain and we were putting cargo nets under the um under the gangways to act as safety nets in case somebody fell off the gangway and if you've handled a cargo net you know they're they're kind of heavy <laughs> a wet cargo net weighs three times as much so it was a lot of work um but I had filled out the form that, that we have everybody fill out who comes on board as a volunteer. And I put my resume in there and I'm a marketing guy. I've spent my career spanned about 40 years of large business working for a fortune 500 company and then my own business, but that's essentially taking care of the, the marketing aspect in both of those. And so the then ship's director comes to me, he goes, why are you in the deck department? You, I want you as a marketing director. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Um, and it, it's been a lot of fun. We do a lot of events where our biggest problem is name recognition because we're kind of in a museum ship rich area in the Bay Area. So we're, our, our big marketing problem is just visibility. And I like to think, you know, we're winning, the, we're winning that fight, but um, we, have a, we have a long ways to go. Um, so that's, that, that's my story. Um, hey, uh, go, go ahead. I know Shane had a couple of questions. No, go no, ahead, that's Shane. All right. sure. I mean, sorry. Uh, thank you, Ken. Is there, it, do you guys, and I, yeah, when we were in San Francisco, we, the Hornet is there. You guys are there. Sub is there. Yeah. Benito. Do you guys yep. have a, cons Brian. I'm sorry, Jeremiah O'Brien. Is that there too? Yeah, yeah. O'Brien is. Yeah, yeah she's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, is there like a consortium that you guys have established just for like that that particular region where you guys work together and right. host right. various events together, or or has there been a talk about that? Yeah, excellent question. Um, good straight man, Shane. I like that. The uh, <laughs> um, we have. And we just started about a year ago putting together not just the historic ships, but all of the World War II related sites in the Bay Area, which are numerous. Um, and we've we've called it the World War II Bay Area Homefront Alliance. Um, and we're we're now trying to figure out we've got the the principal the, the plank holders essentially plank owners are us the hornet um the rosie the riveter park um an organization called spirit of 45 that does a an annual uh world war ii end of world war ii commemoration um and then we're bringing it we brought in the potomac which is roosevelt's yacht 
also based in the Bay Area, uh, and the USS Lucid, which is not a World War II ship, but an interesting ship. She was a, a wooden hauled uh, minesweeper, and she's up in Stockton, so still close to the Bay Area. And we're trying to figure out now what we're going to do with this with this alliance, but certainly we'll have. Uh, probably something like a passport, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. where you go from one ship to the other and you get your passport stamped and there's some benefit at the end once you've filled the whole passport out. Um, also things with school children, we've always worked closely with the Rosie the Riveter National Park and a lot of schools do field trips where they have, uh, the kids will go to our ship in the morning and then they go to the Rosie the River Park in the afternoon it gives them kind of a full uh, a full view of what the shipyards were like and what the World War II industrial complex was like. Um, and so we're looking at doing things that expand on that uh, on that concept as well. But um, yeah, the short answer, yes, <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely doing doing something like that because the the, the history that's been preserved in the Bay Area from the Second World War is is really um, it's it's probably we, we've we've thought about you know other areas of the country and I think we probably have the greatest concentration of preserved World War II significant World War II sites in the country. So when we were in San Francisco, we went to, Sorry. well, we couldn't really get to it because it was like under construction, but Pier 70, where uh, USS the Sullivans was built. So that was, one, oh. of the, that was yeah. one of the spots that we stopped for like our YouTube videos was just okay. that area. Unfortunately, it was uh, fenced off. Of, I guess yeah, it's under construction, construction right now. Looks like they're doing, yeah. uh, making it like a touristy area, but it Is was that it, to be there. Is that in Hunter's Point? I don't, Ooh, I don't remember. That... Oh, okay. Ooh. Yeah, because um, Hunter's Point, when it was turned over to, uh, when when the Navy left, they've been they've been uh, converting it to civilian use. There's been a lot of construction in that area. Yeah, the administration building they turned into a restaurant. Uh, so you know, yeah, okay. it's, just, it's I think it was south of the uh, that famous building there on Market so, Street, and then. I'm trying to think. Yeah, about how yeah, it's that's Hunter's there. Point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's right. It's like along the east side of of San Francisco. So I'm right. not. Sure. Yeah, right. I'm yep. just trying to remember from like looking at the map where it was. Um, yeah. Yeah, we we took an Uber and the guy misheard us and he took us to Pier Seven. Something like that. Right, and we we're like <laughs> <laughs> all the way around the other side. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had to loop around and. Yeah. Let's uh, here. There's a couple of questions I wanted to bring up for you, real quick. Um, sure. One of the of viewers asked, "Does the Red Oak still sail?" Uh, the Red Oak is seaworthy, but we do not have our. We haven't uh, done everything we need to get the Coast Guard to approve us as a um, as a as a passenger ship. It is our goal to do that, and in fact, big step toward that goal in 2018. We lit the steam plant for the first time in 50 years. She went into the mothball fleet in 69. And in, so 2018 was 51 years, um, uh, sorry, 48, 49 years. Um, and we, uh, we lit the steam plant and found the steam plant was in remarkably good condition. Our fact, our, our chief engineer, who is a 20 year merchant uh, sailor and, and uh, qualified engineer, um, he said he was amazed at what, what good shape the uh, the vessel was in. So um, engine wise, we're good. Uh, hull wise, we have a couple of repairs to the hull that need to be done according to the Coast Guard. Um, they're basically some bashed in plates that got bashed in in World War II by the USS New York when we were tied up alongside her and transferring ammunition, but now they have to be fixed. So. Um, that's that's one of the things. That's about hundred and fifty thousand dollar job. The wow. big thing we'll need to do is go into dry dock. We're due. It's been eleven years since we've been in dry dock, and uh, that's as you know, <laughs> a very expensive proposition. For us, it'll be about um, one point two million probably in in dry dock. Have you guys There's ever a had any major of, leaks on board? 
No, actually, the the ship's uh, in 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 good shape. We haven't found any uh, any major leaks. In fact, the leaks are from above. So when we have rains like this, we end up finding a lot of water trickling in. And and as you guys know, with the construction of a ship, um, it comes in one part of the weather deck and then it drips somewhere completely remote from that. Um, so tracing those leaks is uh, is fun. <laughs> uh, but we've been doing a lot of work repairing those. And um, that's hold number one, by the way. That's one of the areas that we don't have open yet to visitors, but it gives a good good view of what a That's really cool. cargo holds are about 38 feet deep on the on the ship and there are either three or two depending on which hold we're talking about. So this is the this is the lower no I'm sorry, this is the middle uh, number one hold. And and I want to, you had talked about uh, you know, relighting the boiler after, you know, a number of years. And I wanted to hit you with some questions about that. But this picture sure. here, I thought was pretty interesting because, okay, so you said it's not open currently. I mean, when you come across sections of the ship like this, are you literally just sandblasting the hell out of it, repainting? Or is there, <laughs> is, is well, that just a bad idea? Yeah, um, unless we've got really wasted steel to to steal john's uh, comment from earlier um we're we're not going to bother with it if it's just a light coat of rust over paint it's not an area that's open to the public then it's not a big concern um but we have areas that are you know clearly there's there's wastage uh the weather decks where it's actually eaten through and we're we're putting we're welding new plate back in and then and then painting that that's our our major focus in terms of uh restoration of of the ship at this point and then anything exterior we're uh sandblasting it or we're actually not allowed to sandblast because the sand might get in the bay needle gunning it which is as you know a much more you know, tedious process um and then and then painting over that uh using uh, paint over rust type primer and then uh, haze gray on top of that. When you talk about bringing the ship into dry dock, when I was on the Jeremiah O'Brien, uh, and this was several years ago, they talked about whenever that ship is in dry dock, they don't do any sandblasting like you mentioned or anything. They literally just stick to pressure washer yeah. because yeah. the metal... If you sandblast, if you needle gun, it'll just keep getting thinner and thinner to the point where there won't be, where there won't be anything left. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of our hull, I think the main concern we'll have going into dry dock is just getting the marine life off and then painting over, uh, painting over that. We were in dry dock 11 years ago, and that's essentially what was done. Uh, but we don't know the condition we don't know a lot about the condition of the hull below the water line. And that's so when we do get into, uh, when we do get into dry dock, that'll be, that's when we'll find out, uh, you know, we're talking 1.2 million right now, but, but who knows uh, what, what other things we'll need to do. In 2018, you guys relit the boilers for the first time. Right. Yep. This is, um, this is our chief engineer, Greg Blaskis, Greg, received the Bozen Marvin Curry Award at the HNSA meeting in, in Hawaii. And unfortunately he couldn't be there, but um, it was well deserved. He he was he was the tribing force behind uh, behind all of this. He in fact I know he personally was inside the burners rebricking the both of them um, before we before we lit off. Uh, but yeah we lit off about twenty uh, 20 separate light offs, got the steam plant up to full temperature and pressure. Uh, we didn't spin the turbines. And the main reason for that was not being sure about the shaft seal. So that's something we're going to need to look at in dry dock. Uh, we've turned the shaft with the jacking gear very slowly, like, you know, the speed of the hour hand on a watch. Um, without any problems but that's one of the that's one of the dry dock issues that we need to deal with now another picture that you had provided 
Yeah. Obviously, engine room. So is this right. part of the tour? If someone were to go to the Red Oak Victory, they'd be able to see this. Yep, sure is. Yeah, we have three tours. This The most pricey one is 20 bucks, and we take people down into the lower engine room and walk them through the... Uh, Walk them through that whole area. These are the the at the bottom of the picture. On the left is the high pressure turbine. On the right is the low pressure turbine, and then behind that, towards the top of the picture, is the reduction gear. And you can barely see there's a um, yeah there's the two turbines. So the closer one to us is the high pressure, and the larger one is the is the low pressure turbine. Did you need yeah. me to go back to that other picture? Uh, no, that's okay. I just, oh, okay. Um, you can see the, you can kind of see the reduction gear behind the, the turbines also. So part of the reason the victories weren't built until later in the war is that these uh, steam turbine engines were being reserved for warships. And I guess we already decided that we are a warship, <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And uh, there was also an issue with, appropriate reduction gears uh, that were, uh, they were being built at a, at a tremendous rate, but they weren't available for, or the, you know, the, the, the Navy decided they would, weren't available for cargo vessels until later in the war. So the, the technology yeah. existed, but uh, it was just a, a tactical decision at the time. When, where was that? When you look at a, Shane and Steven, when you look at a picture like this, does this, I, I don't, I don't know. That's why I'm literally asking this question. Does this at all look similar to anything either on the Little Rock or the Sullivans? The, the one thing that we noticed right off the bat and that we just made a comment about was just the space. Uh, it's very rare to have that much decking uh, you know, in our vessels, of course, certainly not the Sullivans at all. Uh, but no, our uh, fire rooms and engine rooms are a little more cramped than that, no doubt about it. Um, Same with the Slater, too. The Slater's got a fantastic video of that their engine start up, and it's just narrow, narrow catwalks and walkways. Yeah. Yeah, especially the Sullivans, very narrow. Yeah, a lot of catwalks. You know, you're just, your shoulders are bumping against everything, and, uh, uh, I did have a question for Fred. I, I wrote down that you have three tours. Mm -hmm. This just kind of, again, for the, the watchers, they might enjoy this too, but this is a right. museum ship question more. Can you go into the three tours a little bit and uh, what the differences sure. are? And uh, I would say those are Westinghouse turbines as well. Thanks. <laughs> they are indeed. Uh, the, uh, the low price tour is $10. And it's a self-guided tour. We have a trifold uh, booklet that you just walk around the ship on your own and it explains what you're looking at. Um, that does not include the engine room because the Coast Guard doesn't allow us to have unaccompanied visitors in the engine room. The $15 tour um, essentially takes you all over the ship, all the parts that are open to the public and allows people to look down into the engine room from the uh, catwalks that are level with the main deck of the ship. Uh, but they don't go down into the lower engine room, which is two decks below that. And then the $20 tour, you get, you know, it's the cook's tour, as they say. Uh, you get the entire ship and down into the lower engine room. Now for this, say for the 15 and the 20, are those guided then? The 15 are. and the 20 yep. Yeah, we have uh, docents who uh, who lead those tours. Okay. Let's get into some history about how, and this is the, this is the part I think I'm going to find most fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. How did you guys get your hands on the Red Oak <laughs> Victory? It was part of... The mothball fleet, the ghost it fleet, was. whatever you want to call it, uh, it in Sweeson Bay. So, how did you get? How did you get a hold of it? Well, first of all, I'll say she looks better than this picture today. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, in 1996, and I'm not sure how the discovery came about. Somebody said, "Hey, the Red Oak Victory is sitting out there in 
the mothball fleet is the last Richmond Kaiser ship that's still afloat. And mm -hmm. the, the Richmond shipyards built 747 vessels in World War II, between actually even before we were in the war, so between 41 and 46. And the Red Oak Victory is literally the only one left. Uh, all the rest were either lost or scrapped. And Congressman George Miller, who had the Richmond district at that time, um, was instrumental in getting the Maritime Administration to convey the Red Oak Victory to our nonprofit organization, which is called the Richmond Museum Association. And that took place somewhere between 96 and 98. And then the ship was actually moved to uh, a, a space where it could be exhibited and, and restored uh, simultaneously in 1998. It was, a, it was somewhat remote from the position we're in right now, not, not a great location, but it allowed a lot of the, the initial work to be done on the ship. Uh, and you could see the condition she was in from that previous picture when um, she came out of the mothball fleet. Uh, even though the, the mothball fleet is a little ways up the river, so it's in brackish, not salt water, uh, the ships were still in in pretty awful condition. So there's a, there's a lot of just cosmetic work, if nothing else, uh, to do. Um, to do to get the ship back in better condition. I should have taken a picture of the ship from this exact same viewpoint today <laughs> because she looks a lot better. In fact, we just replaced that name board uh, finally <laughs> after all these years. Um, but uh, it was it was a lot of work and uh, a huge commitment on the part of the, the volunteers to uh, uh, to go through and, and, and scrape and repaint and and so on well even uh, before that what was it what was it like to pull a ship like this out of um what are we calling it the ghost fleet the mothball fleet I yeah it, the, couldn't, it the, couldn't have been easy the navy calls it the ready reserve fleet um actually i wasn't around at the time but the whole point of the ready reserve fleet was that the ships in that uh in that collection could be brought back into service in somewhere between 30 and 90 days. So they had to be able to get them out of there pretty quickly, get them to a shipyard and, and get the work uh, commenced. So I don't think that I, I haven't heard any stories from the old guys that it was a, it was really a big deal. Um, we moved the ship when we lit the, the boilers um, in 2018, we moved her to Cal Maritime Academy because uh, that was a, a better location for us to do the work. Um, and the Cal, Cal Maritime's uh, ship, their, their schooling ship was gone for the summer. Um, but that was not a, it was expensive, but it was not a big deal to move the ship that distance. Uh, basically three tugboats, and a towboat at either end, and um, it was a pretty smooth passage. Um, so, yeah, I haven't I haven't heard that that was that that was a big issue. Um, the I think the bigger issue was just the amount of the amount of work that went into doing the restoration. And and it's the restoration's constantly <laughs> ongoing. Uh, it, yeah, it, it never stops. Yeah. Right, as all the museum ship guys know. I mean, you know, the joke about a ship is you start painting at the stern, and when you get to the bow, you go back to the stern and start painting again. So um, it's kind of the kind of the situation we're in. Although what we're doing is addressing the the critical areas, uh, and um, that's uh, you know that that's an ongoing process. I came across a couple of pictures. One of the things that uh, uh, I thought was interesting when I first came across Shane at the Buffalo Naval Park, he talked about how years ago, maybe even decades ago, these ships, you know, operations would trade guns for other equipment, you know, between different ships. And I came across a picture of, <laughs> of this thing. Dumbo. 
Well, yeah. well it looks exactly it looks exactly <laughs> like the five inch gun that you might find on the Sullivans. And it is. <laughs> it's a five inch World War II five inch thirty eight. Um, yeah, we <laughs> we got a call one day. This that was that picture. The previous picture was a Treasure Island. Um, we got a call one day from the Treasure Island Redevelopment Authority, and they said, "We've got this gun, and we need to get rid of it. We're going to scrap it. Do you guys want it?" And yeah, it was like they didn't even get the the last syllable of "Do you want it?" out before we were saying yes. Um, ours, it, the gun is essentially correct for the the Red Oak, except it's a turret uh, mount. Ours is an open mount. And so we converted to, uh, we're in the process actually of completing the conversion uh, to an open mount. But yeah, it, and I, I want to tell one story here too that was uh, just incredible to me. Um, there's a construction company in the Bay Area called Gilati Maggiore. And they're, they've done any huge project in the Bay Area, they've worked on it. And Gary Galati, who's president of the, the company, is a big World War II buff. He loves our ship um, and, and all the World War II stuff in the Bay Area. And so the you know, Treasure Island Development Authority said, you can have this five-inch gun, um, all, what was it, 44,000 pounds of it. And we said, great. <laughs> you know, I mean, we'll come over with a pickup truck and get it. Um, so we called up Gary and we said, hey, is there any way, can you help us out in terms of getting getting this thing moved to the ship? Because it's about a 30, 40 mile drive uh, from Treasure Island to where we're berthed. And Gary said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. He hired Bragg Crane Company who brought their biggest, heaviest crane to pick it up with. That was the previous picture. He brought his flatbed trucks and then repeated the whole process over again to get the, the gun offloaded uh, when they got to the ship. And I, I have, I can't begin to estimate how much money that would have cost us if we had had to pay for it, but um, wow. he took care of it entirely. Is it, and, is it known if that was on a ship and what ship it came from? Um, I think, I, I tried to trace the history of it. I think it was a training mount since uh, probably the Second World War. I talked to one guy who, when we brought it to the ship, he's a volunteer on the ship. He goes, I trained on that gun when I was at, uh, you know, in the early 60s at, um, at Treasure Island. So I, I think it's probably never been on a ship um, as far as we could determine. So do you have, uh, so yeah, the, the original five inch, it might have been a five inch 25. You were talking about that a little earlier, like mm. a prior version maybe of uh, the five inch, then the 38. That, yeah. was smoke, that was an open pedestal, you said, right? That was a, uh, that was just a pedestal gun. Right. Well, that was on the Liberty ships. Um, the, the Victory ships had the five inch 38 open mount. Right. Um, Forget it. Were they open or were, yeah. they, or were they mounted or were they still pedestal mounted? Uh, they were uh, they were on a pedestal, and the, there's a uh, there should be I don't know if you pulled up any of the other pictures. I didn't include one in my set um, of the the gun actually mounted on the on the ship. It goes into the stern uh, gun tub on the ship. Okay. Did they? Oh, so uh, the you did not, not have your five inch, right? You did not have your five inch. We didn't. No, we yeah. in fact had our spare propeller sitting in that gun tub you can yeah you can't really see it you can see the three inch 50 in the forward gun tub and there's a similar construction on the stern for the five inch yeah i don't think i have a picture of the stern yeah i didn't include I know. one either i should have that's all right that's all right um uh, well guys i've been asking the bulk of the questions uh john shane Stephen, what what questions did you have for fred about the red oak victory Oh boy. Um, so late war ship, uh, did she see any combat or any sense of combat? Yeah. Um, the ship was, um, well, in, in fact, let me address, um, uh, the issue of victory ships and, and warships again. Um, 
there were 20 Boulder Victory class ships, which is what the Red Oak Victory is. And these were built specifically for the U.S. Navy, and they were commissioned vessels that carried um, ammunition, fleet ammunition specifically, and turned out to move ammunition directly from the carrying vessel to the warship, you, it had to be a commissioned Navy vessel. Um, and, and so that's why Red Oak Victory was actually USS Red Oak Victory. Uh, her designation was AK-235. And there were, there were 19 other Victory ships that, were, um, that, that performed the same functions for the Navy. Um, and then there were, I mentioned earlier, the attack transports, the Haskell class, attack transports, which carried each about 1,500 troops and 25 LCVP landing craft. They were also commissioned Navy vessels. Um, so, and where was I going with this? What was the question again, Shane? Uh, it was, uh, John, John had asked John. if the Red Oak Victory had seen any, any oh, uh, yeah. battle scenarios. Yeah, um, not, not per se. Uh, she was in the Uliti Atoll. Um, in fact, one of the pictures I left with yep, you, Ken, yep, yep. was a map of the anchorage there. Um, and this was the staging area for the invasion of Okinawa. Um, uh, the, and then from there, uh, she went to the Philippines and was in the last days of the, the war, the last days of the liberation of the, of the Philippines. There's the anchorage in Uliti. Um, in fact, the, the whole atoll isn't visible there. It's about 40 miles long. Um, but every, every ship in the, that was involved in the invasion of Okinawa was anchored in that atoll. I can't imagine the logistics of, of, uh, of managing that. Where um, did you get that map? I pulled it. It's one we've had on the ship for a long time. And I, I finally started, I, I started looking on the internet for a copy of it. Um, and every copy I found of it was thumbnail size. This was the best one I found. <laughs> but yeah, Ulithi was an atoll. It was about, um, I think about a thousand miles south of mainland Japan. So this would also have been the staging area for the, the invasion of Japan had that, had that taken place. But yeah, each circle is a ship. <laughs> so you can see the, you know, the battleships and aircraft carriers, obviously the larger circles and the, uh, all of the support vessels, destroyers and so on. Here's oh, I see a question, question just came up about the name of the ship. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so at the time that she was named, it was thought that Red Oak, Iowa had suffered more casualties per capita than any other community in the United States. Turned out not to be true by the end of the war, but Red Oak certainly was devastated in terms of losing many of their young men. Uh, and that was entirely due to the Battle of the Kazarine Pass, where they were uh, Iowa National Guard uh, federalized. I, I don't remember the, the, um, the division number, um, but that was in honor of those, those men who were lost at Kazarine, uh, who came from Red Oak, Iowa. I um so what, oh go ahead Steve. I had a question. So I mean these were commissioned specifically for the Navy. So mm -hmm. people that were on the ship, I mean, were there was it Navy? Was were, were there civilians because it was yeah. a cargo ship? Like um like who was on the who would have served on the ship or been on the ship? Right. Uh yeah, in World War II this was entirely Navy personnel. Uh 104 officers and enlisted men. I think it was eleven officers and um 95 enlisted men um or 90 93 sorry bad bad at math um so yeah this was a it was a entirely uh navy navy crewed vessel and a lot of crew members when this was a civilian when a victory ship was run by a civilian crew there were about 60 some crew members and the, the reason I was given for that is, first of all, the Navy's not in the business of making a profit, which a 
a, a merchant marine vessel is. And, and so they sort of, I won't say overdid it, but they made sure that they had sufficient personnel to run uh, you know, full watches 24 um, seven. The, the um, merchant marine vessels uh, didn't, didn't have that same requirement. Um, the merchant marine vessels had a Navy complement, though, called the Armed Guard. And the Armed Guard were responsible for the guns on the ship. So, you know, the three inch and five inch guns and the 20 millimeters on a merchant marine vessel would still be manned by Navy personnel. And I believe that's a Geneva Convention thing that. Uh, if you're going to be shooting back at the enemy, you're expected to be a member of the, the military. Um, and that didn't prevent the merchant sailors from manning the guns when it became necessary. Uh, but the, at least that was the uh, less, that was the, th the theory behind it. Um, the Red Oak was turned over in May of 46 back to the maritime administration and so all of her service from 46 to 1970 was as various um, merchant uh, companies various various shipping co private shipping companies and but it, as uh, Ken mentioned she did uh, transport military goods to the Korean conflict and to Vietnam so what's fact, uh, what's I, I, next for the Red Oak victory? What's uh, what do you guys have in the works uh, for twenty twenty three? Ah, yeah, good question. Well, recovering, continuing to recover from from COVID, uh, we like everybody essentially we were almost shut down for uh, the whole the COVID pandemic period, um, which hurt us a lot in terms of revenue as as well as that visibility that I was talking about before. Um, so we're rebuilding that, we're continuing to rebuild that. This We have always run a series of pancake breakfasts in the summer and they're they're really popular. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed about how many people in the Bay Area know about them because the first thing they'll ask when they you say you're with the Red Oak Victory, they go, oh, when's your next pancake breakfast? <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, at least they've heard of us, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we do five of those in a year. And then in previous years, we did three or four uh, other events, music related events, swing dances with a World War II theme. And so we're going back to, we're gonna bring those back uh, this summer. Cool. That's probably the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest change, but continuing to work on uh, getting the ship underway. And, and our, our goal is to have the ship underway and be taking passengers on San Francisco Bay. So um, we did a survey of the museum ships around the country. And you guys might find this interesting. What we found was the ones who were the most financially viable were the ones that were underway with the exception of say the, the aircraft carriers, the large warships like the battleships and so on. Um, but the, for, for a ship our size, um, the, uh, the, the almost necessary element of remaining viable was to be able to take passengers on cruises. So um, we're, we're focused on going that way. I, uh, I wasn't going to post this question because it just opens up, opens up a can of worms, really. But you, you mentioned <laughs> talking about, you know, the viability of these museum ships and, you yeah. know, having them underway. Uh, I've, I can think of the Jeremiah O'Brien. Um, right. Let's see. He, uh, I think the LST 325, is that? It's in Louisville. And is that is that mm -hmm. a ship? No, Evansville. Current? Is, oh yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah. Evansville, Indiana. Um, yeah. So okay. So uh, Lego history. Sam asks the question: Why can't? Why not a Fletcher class? Why, uh, Fletcher class ship? Why not a warship? Stephen, Shane, you guys want to take this question? <laughs> I mean, I could say for the the Little Rock. For, um, I mean, she was gutted, but when we got her. So I mean, there's. Yeah. I mean, it would be. 
impossible. There's nothing in there that could turn her on. Yeah, I. Um, that's a great question that I don't think we've just accepted <laughs> that none of our ships would be able to move. They've been cannibalized. They've been. I mean, out of the three, probably the Croker might have a shot at it. Well, it'd be nice if we can get an engine rolling, you know, and um, the electrical plant. Yeah. But. I, I don't know. Is that the difference between a warship and a merchant ship or, you know, an auxiliary? I don't know again, but uh, it would, it, it, it is near impossible for us with the systems uh, and the uh, junctions that have been cut, the electrical systems. I mean, it's just, it's impossible probably. I mean, can we get, we can maybe work on a turbine and the, but we don't even have our props on the Sullivan. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and John, uh, the, the Slater recently started uh, an engine, that video went viral, but it wasn't one of the propulsion engines. It was literally just a power generator. And why don't you talk about how big of a deal that was? <laughs> well, so we, we that was not the first time we've ever turned that on. We, we, we use that quite often. Um, it's the first time we really took video of it. But um, the Slater technically we could get underway if we ever decided to put the work in um so there's four diesel engines they'd all have to be overhauled unofficial estimates are like 10 million dollars like 15 years ago to do all the work um the des uh, the, the diesel des the bottom of the fuel tank is the bottom of the hull five eighths inch of steel between the ocean and your fuel so we wouldn't want to spring a leak. Um, so you got just the sheer amount of work to restore the engines, um, potential leaks. Then you got to get the knowledge to do it. Um, I, I think the only way we would ever be able to do this is if one, somebody just bankrolled the entire thing for us. Um, or two, we do some sort of auxiliary power where we don't even touch the propulsion plant. Uh, we still have the the uh, the screws uh, they were never taken off because we we came from a foreign navy the greeks we don't have to adhere to any of that you know we just have to be coast guard approved more or less our motor wearable does work we do take the motor wearable out we don't let people uh, visitors <laughs> on it though for insurance reasons but our volunteers mm -hmm. go out on the hudson every every week here's a here's another question that i find pretty interesting um I know the Buffalo Naval Park has, but have uh, any of the ships been used as sets or film locations? Yeah, Slater has a few times, actually. Oh, really? For what? For uh, what productions? Um, so when she was in the Greek Navy, she's, a, she's in the closing credits of Guns of Navarone. Um, oh, yeah. There's a fleet of destroyer escorts. She's one of them. We don't know which one. Um, Alice in the Navy was a Greek film in the 60s i believe and it was filmed on on the uh, the itos the slater um and then in 2008 a japanese film company came up to albany and filmed a movie on board okay yeah but it was um, only released in japan <laughs> what about what about well, the buffalo naval park yeah i mean wasn't there there's a like a like a corny space navy movie that took place on the sullivan's yeah. i think some of the staff i guess were in it um too as like extras this was before my time i don't know if you yeah, were here before my time too uh there oh, is goodness. a fabulous movie with vivica fox called crossbreed is that what it is yeah <laughs> yeah and uh <laughs> they use the missile house uh and they and other areas of the ship but they made it look like it's a spaceship as opposed to a uh uh, a museum ship or a, oh. a ship. Um, so ghost hunters. Uh, yeah. The ghost hunters from A and E were here and they, oh, really? filmed the, huh. you know, they filmed the a one hour long episode. Uh, to my knowledge, that is to my knowledge, that might be it. What about the red Oak victory, Fred, anything on board there? We are in the convoy in Greyhound. Oh, wow. oh, and you say, well, how did really? that happen? Yeah. So the movie company came and spent two days scanning the entire ship, the both from the dock and, and from the deck. And we're in the movie for maybe three seconds. Uh, 
um, <laughs> there's a point there's a point where you see the uh, some of the sailors on Tom Hanks destroyer are looking out across the convoy and the nearest ship is the Red Oak Victory. Is and it called the Red Oak Victory? No. Um, you is can't it, even, you uh, can't see the you can't see the bow uh, or I mean you can't see the name on the ship and they never they never say anything about it. We recognize it because it's a victory ship, right? Um, I was impressed though with the movie company because all of our cargo booms are up or most of them are and somebody at that movie company was smart enough to know they wouldn't be like that at sea and so they modified the the image so that all of them were down and locked in their cradles um but yeah we're we're in there now greyhound takes place in 42 and they didn't build any victory ships until 44 but you know who's who's being picky right <laughs> right <laughs> the um, o'brien i is do know also. I do know that, the, well, the Jeremiah O'Brien, I do know that there was a film crew from the movie Titanic in the engine yeah. room of the Jeremiah O'Brien. So I was aware of that. Um, other than that, that's all I know. Um, yeah, that engine so. room scene in Titanic is the it's a great view of a triple expansion steam engine in operation. <laughs> well, Ken, remember when we were in Chicago, they said they used the sounds in the U505 for Das Boot. And, That's right. And they, yeah. okay. didn't they they were trying to get or they did get like his Oscar to put on display. She oh, was talking yeah. about it. Or they mm. yes. good call. That's right. Um, well yeah, they, they <laughs> yeah. to the U five oh five to do the sound for Das Boot. What was it Das Boot or was it uh U five seventy one? It was one oh, of the one of the two movies. You're right. It was U five seventy one. U five seventy one. Yeah, and this guy went everywhere within the U505 in Chicago recording all kinds of different sounds for the movie. It was yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I totally forgot about it, but it was a pretty impressive story. That's good. Um well, uh, Fred, I I want to thank you for coming on with us. I was looking at the clock. Well, thanks and, for having uh, me. I didn't I didn't think uh, <laughs> I didn't think we'd we'd have you on for as long as we did, but obviously, if we did, it was fascinating stuff. So I definitely appreciate you giving us the time. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so it's time now, right? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> for Fred, it's dinner time now. Yeah. Yeah. In California. yeah. A little past, actually, but that's all right. I'll survive. <laughs> Well, you know, definitely uh, thanks to Fred Klink, Fred Oak, uh, Red Oak Victory, uh, Fred, the uh, chairman and marketing director for the Red Oak Victory Museum. You can check out their YouTube channel simply by searching for Red Oak Victory, as well as checking out the website, www.redoakvictory.us. That's the key. It's .us, not .com. Um, Fred, anything else you want us to add? Um, no, I think we covered a, a pretty good range of stuff. I made some cheat notes here for myself. I just wanted to glance at them quickly, but, um, I go think for it. We, yeah. I think we, um, yeah, I think we covered everything. We talked about the difference between victory and Liberty ships and, uh, how we came to, to have the, the Red Oak victory at the Richmond Museum Association. So, um, I think we're good. And what are you guys currently open for tours? Yes, we are. Yeah, we're only open okay. on Sundays. Um, like every other business in the country, we had a heck of a time getting people to come back after COVID. And so mm -hmm. we've only got a small complement of docents. Um, mm -hmm. If any of you guys want to move to California, get away from the snow. Um, I've heard about snow. I just, I, I'm <laughs> interested okay, that was nice. snow people who've actually been in it. Um, yeah. No, I shouldn't say that. I grew up in Chicago. Trust me, I know snow. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But well, then uh, you know what's going on yeah, over we're... here in Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. we're uh, well. Thanks yeah, again, we're Fred. We're going to um... increase our docents. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, what I wanted to say before we uh, before we uh, shove you off is for viewers, subscribers, anyone watching this video after the live broadcast, watching it on replay, if you are in the richmond california area northern california you have the opportunity to visit the red oak victory please do uh learned a lot about it i've seen your videos on the youtube channel you've got a lot to offer so definitely check out the red oak victory um, Thank you. 
Well, like I said a few moments ago, Fred Klink, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to give you the shove off so we can talk behind your back. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you, Fred. All right. Thanks, Fred. Thank you, guys. Fred. Great Good to see, see you again. again. All right. Yeah. All right. You have, you have a great evening. So this was this was uh, Shane's idea for having Fred on, and and I'm and and I'm glad Shane promoted that because I did not a lot of the stuff that Fred had to offer tonight I just wasn't aware of. First of all, the difference between a victory and a Liberty ship. I thought a victory ship actually came before the Liberty ships. I was wrong about that. Um, obviously, talking about. Uh, Henry Kaiser is a is a big deal. So uh, I was definitely happy to have Fred on tonight. Learned a lot. Yeah, it was a great episode tonight. That was a great yeah, guest. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So uh, what? Um, before we sign off here, John Epp, curator, USS Slater. What's coming up next for the Slater? I know you guys are shut down for the winter, but you're not really because I'm seeing posts on Facebook about your your volunteer activities. Yeah, uh, so we're closed until early April. Um, until then, we're just doing uh, restoration and maintenance work. The biggest project is hopefully before opening day, we'll have a new shoreside facility. Uh, so fingers crossed. Have you, have you guys broken ground on that yet? So technically, we're not allowed to break ground. It has to be mobile. So it's, uh, Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You, you mentioned that in a previous video. Okay. So yeah. you're going to be constructing an above ground or on ground facility. Yeah. So we're, we're, basically, it's, gonna, it's a modular trailer. It's going to be two trailers put together. It's going to be built in Georgia and then shipped up to Albany. Nice. Gotcha. Gotcha. And let's see, for the Buffalo Naval Park, Shane Stevenson, Stephen Tedesco, what do you guys have uh, coming up next? Just uh, getting ready to go straight into encampments in March, which is going to be here before we know it. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're actually expanding our encampment program a little bit this year to kind of test something out. We do like uh, Saturday night into Sunday. So we're going to try one weekend where we do Friday evening to Sunday morning. John, do you guys do just one night or do you do both nights? We just do one night and um, it's always like Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. Yeah, I mean, the majority of us is um, um, our campers are Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts as well. Uh, we do have, get families once in a while, um, but um, and most of them from the Cleveland area, which is like. I think probably... they have insurance because um, we have, we, we require they have their own group insurance. That's yeah, what typically that's the Boy Scouts. We we have them add us onto their insurance when they come here. Okay. Um. Yeah, usually, it, so a lot of them come from the same council, so it's like it's it's pretty easy. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many people come from the Cleveland area. I mean, the majority just blanket the insurance over the whole troop or whatever? right. So like we're in the Greater Niagara Council, so anything in that. Um, it's like Niagara County, Erie sure, County, okay. whatever. They're all under one council, all under one insurance. Um, so we're going to try this two-day thing. Um, we'll see how it goes. I don't know. Yeah, that's it. And then just uh, boatloads of collections to process. <laughs> uh, for me, it's see, so does fun. yours build up over the year? I'm sorry? Does yours build up in a huge pile over the season? Of course, it um, let me let me take that. Let me take that question, John, because I was just at the Buffalo Naval Park last month. I've been in Shane's office. Um, it does build up. You know, I, I don't know how he's going to get through this mountain of work. I mean, I'm sure you will. But it's I, all joking aside, it, you got a lot going on over there in that office. Yeah, yeah we uh, are setting up our I should have taken a picture of it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, maybe I'll do that for next time. But also, again, for those people that are on that maybe weren't on right in the beginning, our, we're starting our memberships for YouTube, four ninety nine a month. You get one extra uh, exclusive uh, twenty hundred watch with Shane and Stephen. Ask questions, all of that stuff. Uh, we can get into much more deeper conversations and two member videos. 
above and beyond just the subscribers a month. So three extra things a month you will get for the four ninety nine. We will be releasing that tomorrow or hopefully tomorrow. Friday at the latest. Friday at the latest. This week. So we'll show it. We'll do a short little video giving more of an introduction to it. And and uh, please become members if you choose to. It's yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. For anyone interested, you know, they're going to have uh, exclusive content on the Buffalo Naval Park's YouTube channel. Uh, simply search for Buffalo Naval Park and it'll come up. So it'll be the 20 hundred watch that we've all seen in the past. It'll be additional exclusive content. Uh, it'll be a members only portion of their YouTube channel. Uh, click on it. Um, join. It's, it's just a great way to throw additional revenue and support to the Buffalo Naval Park. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have going on. And once summer comes to, we'll be able to do a lot more, um, even live shows and not necessarily at eight o'clock, but just, you know, like Shane's been going live um, randomly and it, yeah, and very it randomly, picks up steam. But... It's amazing how many people without, I mean, I know they subscribe to the channel, so they probably get a notification, uh, which is fantastic. I mean, we can't thank the viewers enough, but um you know, we, we've been starting to mess around with these like pop-up live shows. So yeah, sure. Very true. I don't normally take the opportunity to promote anything on museum ship mafia. I want it to be about the Buffalo Naval park and the USS Slater, but there, there is something that I've got coming up. Uh, a lot of people have probably noticed. I haven't been posting much in the way of video content on history X because I've been working on this project. Um, we're calling it the grave robbers. Hopefully it's going to be available and up next week, Wednesday. I'd love to have it, uh, go live, uh, Wednesday evening. Basically what this is, is it's a 45 minute, approximately a 45 minute video about the shipwrecks in the South Eastern uh, I'm sorry, the Southwestern Pacific, Southeast Asia that are getting robbed. And these are H, these are ships like the HMS Repulse, the HMAS Perth, the Prince of Wales. These are all ships that went down during the Battle of Java Sea. And now they're getting raided and looted by operations that are, that are just stripping them for their steel. So it's a documentary that I saw a while ago. I don't think too many people here in the States are aware of it. They need to be aware of it. And this is a video that I'm going to have. Uh, Sonny the Soccer Cat also mentions the HMS Exeter. Um, these are grave sites that are getting dredged up and stripped for their steel. So this is a video that I'm, I'm working on. Hopefully I'll have it finished next week. Uh, called the Great Robbers. So keep an eye out for that. Will there will there be I'm an sorry. audible version? Will the an audible version? Yeah. I'll no, I, I think Ken, that is an the yeah, that's an awesome that's an awesome project. I look forward to seeing Yeah, I'm excited that. to see yeah. it. I'll, uh, I'm going to throw it to you guys ahead of time just to see if there's anything that needs to be edited out or added. So added. So once it's uh, done, you guys will get an advanced copy. But uh, keep an eye out for that as well. Like I said, I don't usually promote stuff on History X here on Museum Ship Mafia, but I definitely wanted to throw that out there. Um, so, okay, John Epp, curator, USS Slater. You can check out the Slater at uh, their YouTube channel. Search for the USS Slater or www.ussslater.org. And for Shane Stevenson and Stephen Tedesco, the Buffalo Neary County Naval Military Park, check out their YouTube channel, search for Buffalo Naval Park or their website, buffalonavalpark.org. And also thanks to tonight's sponsor, Audible Audiobooks. Check out the link below in the description for this broadcast. Click on the link and uh, see what you can find on Audible. Um, anything else you guys want to add? Uh, you know, it, it's a shame we couldn't get to Ryan again, so... Well, and, and our apologies, you know, Ryan always makes himself available in the event we have time for him. Unfortunately, Ryan Szymanski with Battleship New Jersey. There's always next time. Uh, <laughs> let's see. For, for audio versions of this podcast, search for Museum Ship Mafia on your favorite podcast platform. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. And for uh, John Epp at the USS Slater and Stephen Tedesco and Shane Stevenson at the Buffalo Naval Park. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Everyone have a oh, great yes. evening. Yeah. Good night, everybody.